Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, we're joined by Jillian MacArthur. Jillian earned her Master's in Chemistry at the University of Strathclyde, which also involved a year-long placement at Bayer in Germany. Afterwards, she came to the University of Manchester, where she's currently pursuing her PhD in the Larossa Group. And from there, I'll hand it over to you, Jillian. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's absolutely brilliant to be on board. Today, I'll be talking through the project that I've been working on throughout my PhD, which is all about how we've developed a new air and moisture stable ruthenium catalyst and how we've taken that and then applied it in a wide variety of different reactions. I'll begin with why this catalyst is such an important development. As you can see, there are many ruthenium catalysts that have already been reported. However, these aren't without their limitations. First off, we have the catalysts on the left, which are air and moisture stable. These are great because they're easy to use. However, the downside is that they have a high activation barrier and you need to provide energy using high temperatures or light to access the catalytic pathway. On the other hand, where more reactive catalysts have been reported, such as the two shown on the right, although they can be used under mild conditions and have really high reactivity, they're often extremely air sensitive and decay as soon as they're exposed to oxygen. This is shown in the images below where you can see an example of one of the catalysts decaying as soon as it's removed from the glove box. This means that although these have great reactivity, they're heavily reliant on specialised equipment, which not everyone has access to. This means that the chemist currently faces a choice. There's nothing that lies between these two extremes, no middle ground. And what happens is the majority will reach for the ones that are easy to handle, shown here on the left. This is demonstrated by the fact that over 15,000 reactions have been reported with ruthenium parasimine dimer in the last five years alone. That's 15,000 reactions where the conditions could potentially be improved if something that little bit more reactive was used in its place. This is exactly what we wanted to address. We wanted to develop a catalyst that is both air and moisture stable while having that high reactivity that allows it to work under mild conditions. The way that we did this was by designing a catalyst with a mixed ligand sphere. The final structure is shown on the right hand side. The pavalonitrile ligands are fairly stable and their steric bulk provides protection aiding the air stability of the catalyst. The lability of the water ligand is many orders of magnitude greater than that of pavalonitrile and is key to the catalyst's high reactivity. Because of this key water ligand, we've named the catalyst Ruaqua. When we compare the air stability of Ruaqua to the previously shown highly reactive complexes, Ruaqua is air stable while the others decay when removed from the glove box, and we can see this through the colour change. We actually know that Ruaqua is air stable with no special storage conditions for periods of well over one year. The other important attribute of the catalyst is high reactivity, and we examined this following an important stoichiometric reaction by NMR. At just 40 degrees after four hours, we observed 80% conversion to this bis-cyclometallated species shown in the bottom right. We know from previous studies that this is an important intermediate for orthofunctionalization procedures. Of course, the true test would come when we move on from this and take it one step further. Can we get it to actually function as a catalyst? The first way that we examined this was through the orthoarylation of these directing group motifs. We have 12 examples of this with good yields and we're even able to expand this to some really difficult substrates, including the coupling of two late stage fragments showing the power of this method. You'll note here that when you use alternative commercial air stable catalysts such as ruthenium parasimine dimer or ruthenium trichloride, the yield drops significantly. We then began targeting more challenging ortho functionalizations, including the secondary alkylation of such directing groups. We have 10 successful examples of this with promising yield, and we're once again able to extend this to more challenging substrates, such as the oxyprosin derivative shown here. We then took this one step further and targeted the primary alkylation of these motifs. We successfully transformed 12 more substrates to the corresponding products and could even use the more challenging amine functionality as a directing group, leading to the overall functionalized ketone shown here. We also looked at the simplest alkylation procedure i.e. CH methylation, which is an important transformation because of the magic methyl effect. These worked really well and formed the monofunctionalized product with great selectivity. Because these reactions were so clean and high yielding, we could actually isolate the products from the start material through column chromatography rather than through HPLC, even for complex substrates such as diazepam. One of the great things about ruthenium is that you can target different sites of selectivity by changing the conditions. We were able to demonstrate Ruaqua's effectiveness for the meta-functionalization of directing group arenes with five different examples. We could do this using moderate temperatures of 40 or 50 degrees, or light could also be used as an alternative if desired. 
The conditions for these reactions were taken from the literature and no optimization was performed. We only reduced the reaction temperature. And even though the reaction conditions were optimized using ruthenium pyrocyamine dimer and many of these literature examples, Ruaqua performed significantly better using these lower temperatures. We wanted to show that these procedures were robust and easy to implement even in industrial settings, and AstraZeneca were kind enough to run one of our reactions for us at their site in Macclesfield. The reaction was set up using conditions amenable to further scale up, and we were also able to swap the solvent from NNP to dimethyl carbonate to make the procedure more appealing for industrial use. The reaction was run on a 5 gram scale and was successful, given the product and 78% yield. At this point, we really began to consider the potential of Ruaqua and began to wonder what else might be expected of a generic ruthenium pre-catalyst. What else do we have to show that it can do to make people want to have a bottle in the lab and use in their own reactions? One of the first reactions we expanded the use of Ruaqua to was hydrogen deuterium exchange using D2O as a deuterium source. This worked really well given the isotopologue and up to 95% yield. We were even able to use more challenging directing groups such as benzoic acid, which was transformed to the corresponding product in 69% yield. Ruthenium is also really well established in transfer hydrogenation reactions. These typically work really well, and it's great to see that Ruaqua was able to participate in these transformations with high yields. Although Ruaqua performed the same as other commercial catalysts at 50 degrees, when we move to 25 degrees, these other catalysts don't perform as well, and we once again see the benefit of Ruaqua's high reactivity. We continued to expand the scope of reactions that Ruaqua could perform, and began looking at this alkene isomerization shown here. The previous gold standard catalyst for this was the ruthenium allyl complex shown here on the right, which was reported in Nature Communications a few years ago, and this was specifically designed for this purpose. Not only were we able to match the low catalyst loading of just 50 parts per million, we were also able to significantly reduce the reaction temperature from 150 degrees to 80 degrees while keeping that yield high. We could also do this hydroalkynylation chemistry, giving the product in a moderate yield of 37%, while the other commercial catalysts both gave less than 10% conversion to the product. So we've looked at some hydride-based chemistry. What about oxidative chemistry? Can we do this as well? And the first way that we explored this was through the oxidative cleavage of alkenes, using sodium pyridate as an oxidant. Once again, we have a few examples for this, and we're able to extend it to more complex molecules, such as triprolidine and lumefantrine with moderate yields. We also looked to the sp3 CH oxidation of adamantane, once again using sodium pyridate as an oxidant, and we're able to form a mixture of the alcohol and diol products with an overall yield of 66%. We were also able to perform this courteous rearrangement at room temperature, given the corresponding isocyanate and 82% yield. Once again, Ruaqua outperformed the other commercial catalysts examined for this reaction. We then began to consider other potential uses of Ruaqua. You might remember that its structure is fairly simple, containing a mixture of nitrile and water ligands that can be easily removed. Because of this, we started to wonder if we could use Ruaqua as a starting material in the synthesis of other complexes. An efficient way that we found to do this was using mechanochemistry, and we used this to make a range of derivatives of ruthenium trispipi, which is a commonly used photocatalyst. These reactions are incredibly easy to set up. Not only can the reaction be done in air, no other additional reagents are required. You simply mix Ruaqua with three equivalents of the ligand, and after an hour of mixing, you have your desired photocatalyst. When other ruthenium catalysts were used, not only were the yields significantly lower, the reactions were also a lot messier, and they couldn't be purified in this way. So we now know that Ruaqua can be used as a start material in the synthesis of other complexes, can we once again take this one step further? What about making a library of new complexes in situ? When you think about palladium chemistry, what you'll often see is that someone would take something like palladium acetate and mix it with a series of different ligands to generate a library of different palladium complexes, which they can then evaluate in the desired reaction. Nothing like this is readily available for ruthenium at the moment, because the commonly used catalysts have too high an activation barrier. So if we can use Ruaqua to rapidly synthesize a library of complexes in situ, this is actually a big step forward in the field of ruthenium catalysis. The way that we looked at this was through this previously reported GEESE edition. We took 15 different bipyridine and phenanthroline analogues and examined their performance in two different solvents over 4 and 18 hours. A library of complexes were successfully generated in situ and their performance was evaluated in the reaction. Ligand 13 had the best performance and when we isolated the corresponding complex, 
and employed that directly in the reaction, we were pleased to see that the results translated really well. The commonly used ruthenium trispipi gave only 22%, but the bathophenanthrolene catalyst from our optimised ligand gave 85% conversion to the desired product, and we were able to improve this reaction really quickly and efficiently through this streamlined method. We also wanted to see if Ruaqua would be amenable to other high-throughput methods. For example, can we use it for the discovery of new reactions? To do this, we took a library of reducible substrates and mixed them with pinnacle borane and phenosilane in the presence of Ruaqua to see what we observed. With phenosilane we got a 66% hit rate, and with pinnacle borane we got a 70% hit rate. One cool thing about this is that we've actually already found reactions that have never been reported with ruthenium before, so we've already found some new chemistry using this method. With all that being said, I wanted to show you this summary to really drive home just how powerful this catalyst is. The scheme summarises the performance of the three catalysts in all of the different reaction classes that we studied. The darker the square, the higher the yield. You can see that Ruaqua performed really well here throughout. In comparison, the other catalyst reactivity was much lower. In fact, in every case we examined, Ruaqua performed equal to or better than the currently available commercial catalyst. This is actually despite using conditions from the literature, many of which were optimised for these commercial catalysts. So if you are considering trying some ruthenium catalysis, we hope that you keep Ruaqua in mind. Today I've gone through the synthesis of Ruaqua, which can be made on a decagram scale in an easy and straightforward manner. This in combination with its long-term air and moisture stability means that it's commercially viable, which is really important when you consider facilitating access to the wider community as a whole. We're currently in talks with different providers at the moment to try and get this on the market, so that you can get your hands on some as easily as possible. Ruaqua also boasts an extremely diverse reactivity profile, with over 15 different reaction types already established. This high reactivity makes Ruaqua an extremely versatile platform for discovery, and I can't wait to see what other people are able to use it for, now that the paper has been published. Let me just conclude by giving a couple of thank yous. First, thank you to my supervisor, Igor. It's an honour to be part of such a great group and have the opportunity to work on such an exciting project. Thank you to all of the other authors who are listed here for all their hard work and contributions. I would also like to thank the staff that run the services at the University of Manchester, as well as our funding sources for the project. I also thank you for watching. If you haven't already, do be sure to check out all of the other videos available on Synthesis Workshop. There's some truly great resources available, including a variety of guest talks such as this one, as well as a terrific online lecture series. Thank you once again for your attention. I hope that you've enjoyed. Thank you for tuning in for this Research Spotlight episode, and thank you to Jillian for a very nice talk. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast, and feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time.